increase the attention span in children with autism spectrum disorder. So what is autism spectrum disorder? It's whenever an individual has significant language and communication deficits, um, they have restrictive and like repetitive behaviors and interests. There's two types of functioning that somebody can have with autism. There's high functioning autism and then low functioning. High functioning is whenever a person can use language and communication in a typical way, but they still kind of have some struggles with understanding if they were having a conversation with somebody. And then low functioning is whenever they have severe language deficit, they have barriers to communication, they display rep repetitive behaviors, and they are inflexible to changes. There is three different levels of ASD that an individual can be diagnosed with. There is level one, which is whenever an individual needs minimal supports to complete their daily task and with social activities. Then there is level two, and that's whenever they need moderate assistance to kind of pick up on social cues and with tasks of their daily life. And then level three is they need maximum supports for almost every aspect of their life. The prevalence of ASD worldwide is out of every 1,000 children, six kids will be diagnosed with autism. Recently, there's been a major increase in the diagnosis. This is believed to be because parents and doctors are able to pick up on the early signs and symptoms, making it easier to diagnose early. There is no specific cause for why a kid gets diagnosed with autism, and there is no cure. Some early indicators of autism are um, if a baby doesn't babble or point by the age of one. They don't say one word phrases by 16 months, so like mom, dad. They don't say two word phrases by age two. They don't respond to their name. Um, loss of language or social skills the child once had, poor eye contact, excessive lining up of their toys, and no smiling or social expressions. Some later indicators that a child has autism is an impaired ability to make friends and socialize with their peers, and impaired ability to initiate conversation with others, repetitive language, abnormally intense interest, um, object or subject fixations, and they um, are inflexible to adherence to routine. A doctor has to diagnose autism. It's usually a multi multidisciplinary team that diagnoses them that can compose of a physician, a psychologist or psych psychiatrist, a speech language pathologist, and then any other um, like neuro or cognitive doctors or other professions. Children should be screened for autism in their 18 to 24 month wellness visit. Um, they can get diagnosed from the signs and symptoms, but doctors and other professions also use the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders to diagnose this. There has to be a big comprehensive evaluation done to determine if a child has autism. That usually involves neurological assessments, in-depth cognitive assessments, in-depth language assessments, and hearing assessments. Um, so our thesis statement for our project is the current research highlights how specific sensory interventions can increase the attention span of a child who is diagnosed with autism. It's important to first know what sensory integration is. So sensory integration is the brain's ability to integrate information that is received from the body's sensory systems. Um, Well-regulated and appropriately functioning sensory systems contribute to important outcomes in performance of occupations, whether that's ADLs, social, emotional, physical, motor communication, self-care, and cognitive skills. So basically, it's just all of the senses combined. So sensory integration disorder, also known as sensory processing disorder, is the inability to like rapidly compose all of these senses together at the same time. It's a neurological disorder that results from the brain's inability to integrate information received from the senses. One in six children report sensory processing issues within the United States. So it's important to note that this is very common 
and often not looked at. Um, it can also be described as a difficulty detecting, modulating, interpreting, and organizing sensory stimulus. Those with um, sensory processing disorders have difficulty detecting, modulating, interpreting, and organizing the senses. So children with sensory processing disorders um, are very common in children with and without disabilities. So approximately 10 to 55% without disabilities have sensory processing issues, um, and 40 to 80% of children with disabilities experience sensory processing issues, including those with autism spectrum disorder. So it's important to look at the different components of sensory processing disorder. So it first starts with sensory modulation disorder. Um, sensory modulation disorder is described as impairment in the intensity and nature of behavior and responses to sensory input. Sensory based motor disorder is poor motor planning and postural instability resulting from ineffectual processing of sensory information. And sensory discrimination disorder is the inability to interpret differences and similarities between information received from the senses. Sensory modulation disorder, as you can see on the left hand side, is then later composed of sensory over responsivity, sensory seeking, and sensory under responsivity. So, sensory processing differences, kind of going back to the sensory modulation, is composed of hyposensitivity or under responsiveness. So, this is often children that have a high threshold. Um, they need a lot of sensory input because they're often unresponsive or unaware of sensory surroundings. Sensory seeking children is like a next nice step down from this. Um, it's excessive and soluble drive for sensory experiences, and they're often can be dangerous for them because they tend to climb to unsafe heights, um, obsessively touch others, or mess with things that they shouldn't be. Um, so they can be a danger to themselves and also to others. Those that are hypersensitive or over-responsive, these children have a th low threshold. So they often overreact to sensations that are not typically perceived as threatening to others. And they have an outburst um, when something is going on. So this could be something as simple as a tag touching them, um, someone standing too close to them, something not being in line or in order as they would like. And then there's sensory avoidance. So sensory avoidance is where the sensory hypersensitive children kind of totally dysregulate. They remove themselves as much as possible from surroundings to get away from it. So sensory processing disorder and occupational performance, um, these difficulties will affect development, learning, playing, working, socializing, exhibiting age-appropriate behaviors, and performance of ADLs. Social deficits are common in children with sensory processing disorders, as studies have found that children with sensory modulation disorders are less likely to participate in activities outside of school. They will also have learning and attention problems in school, as studies have found that 40% of children with sensory processing disorders have poor selective attention for visual motor tasks. All right, as Tiffany mentioned, one of the main components of sensory processing disorder is sensory modulation disorder. The sensory modulation disorder is an impairment in regulating the degree, intensity, or the nature of natural responses. This impacts a child's ability to complete ADLs independently and to also, also carry out social activities well. It affects specifically children with ASD due to the fact they suffer from anxiety, repetitive behaviors, social issues, motor skill impairments, all related back to sensory modulation deficit. Children with ASD also have difficulties regulating and organizing the type and intensity of behavioral responses to sensory input that matches the environmental demands around them. Okay, so sensory modulation and occupational therapy. How can we help kids with SMD? The knowledge and skills of OTs can be used to make interventions and treatment sessions with children that have ASD and other neurological impairments. The children that are at risk for sensory modulation disorders by, by, <laughs> besides ASD are children with learning disabilities, emotional regulation challenges, and attention challenges. The benefit of interventions, it gives the children opportunities to learn how to respond behaviorally appropriate to stimuli we can teach them how to react to overwhelming or underwhelming stimuli and children who struggle academically, socially, and within their ADL. We can also help them um, 
and regulate their sensory modulation whenever they become dysregulated. So overall, some goals of intervention, there's many, but just a few. We want to teach children how to recognize their arousal state and expand the number of self-regulation strategies that they can use in the world out around them whenever they come into hard situations. And we want them to create the best attempts to respond efficiently to demands of a specific situation or a task. We want to use sensory-based activities that are age-appropriate in activities that are um, client-centered, so they're involved and they can learn to promote regulation of arousal, attention, and emotion. We want to lead them towards a just right state of mind, improve self-efficacy, improve self-regulation, increase ADL and IDL independence, and to also improve hyper-responsivity and hyper-responsivity. So interventions for self-regulation, this is one of the interventions that I'm going to be focusing on. The first intervention that OTs can use are social stories. Social stories are pretty much any intervention that gives a child a chance to apply responses to real life situations, whether this is playing a board game with a therapist and their child or pretend play, anything that teaches them how to put their words to feelings and emotions so they can um, work on prob problem solving whenever they become dysregulated. We can teach them calming strategies, breathing techniques like five finger breathing, self-talk strategies to increase their self-esteem. We can teach them about the zones of regulation so they can have their own little interventions whenever they become dysregulated. Weighted vest, two proprioceptive activities we can do are obstacle courses and wheel barkers. We can also use vestibular movement patterns like swinging and therapeutic listening to increase self-regulation. School participation is huge for children with sensory modulation disorder and kids with autism. Um, there is a lot of sensory stimuli in schools, especially in an elementary school. If you've ever been in an elementary school, there's stuff happening everywhere. So this can be very overwhelming to kids. So this can impact their avoidance to school due to the elevated responses. It can lower their interest. And if they're not succeeding in that environment, then they're going to constantly feel like they're failing, which is also going to increase avoidance. So interventions that we can apply to this situation, we can provide assistive technology, reduce barriers that limit the participation, and we can complete an analysis of the classroom and give the teacher or whoever else recommendations to help improve their participation. Some simple accommodations and technology we can recommend are weighted vests, alternative seating arrangements, lap pads, wiggle cushions, and headphones. And these are the zones of regulation that we briefly touched on. And um, we have the blue zone, sad, bored, tired, sick. A lot of time when a child is in this zone, you just want to encourage them to talk about their feelings, maybe reach out to someone they can trust. The green zone is where we want to stay. This is the ideal place we want to go. Um, whenever they're in the green zone, this is a good place for you to talk to them about what they can do when they're in these other zones. It's good to talk about what they can do to get to a good state when they're already in a good state. The yellow zone, if they're feeling worried or frustrated or too excited, this is a good chance for them to take a walk, maybe draw a picture, take a couple deep breaths, do something to get back to a calm state. And if they ever get to a red zone in this position, they're going to need to stop whatever they're doing, ask for help and reach out to someone and also breathing techniques could help as well. Okay, the concept of sensory processing dysfunction in children is based on gene errors research and the theory developed in the mid 1960s, sensory integration approach or theory. OTs form hypotheses about the link between atypical behaviors and neurological processes, which are then used clinically to help explain behavior and plan interventions for children diagnosed with ASD. Some of them Kayla mentioned. Sensory-based interventions are among the most commonly requested services by parents of children with ASD, with at least 60% of children receiving um, sensory-based interventions. Preliminary evidence suggests that some SBIs may be effective in reducing challenging behaviors in children with ASD. One of which that we took a deep dive into was the Wilbarger Deep Pressure and Proprioceptive Technique, known as DPPT. It's also known as the Wilbarger Brushing Protocol. Developed by Patricia Wilbarger, who's an OTR, the DPPT uses a specific pattern of stimulation delivered using a special type of brush and general joint compressions applied over two hours over a several week period. 
DPPT is designed to facilitate the coordination of mind, brain, body processes in a manner that influences positive change. The brush is in that picture right there that you would be utilizing. Steps for brushing, you would be holding the brush in your hand horizontally. Let me use my friend over here. So you would have the brush in your hand. Without losing contact with the child's body, you would be brushing their arms and legs, shoulder to wrist, and by sandwiching their extremity between your hand and the brush. So you're going to be brushing like this, making sure that you're pushing on the child's extremity. Um, sorry, two to three strokes should be done in each area. So you're making sure that you're moving the child's arm around or their leg, whichever area that you're doing, and that you're not losing contact. So you're not grabbing different areas at the same time. That can be kind of um, disruptive. So this would also be followed by gentle joint compression. So you would be doing joint compressions on that area and following that up every time. Um, you never want to brush the face, stomach, groin, or over any open areas of skin. You can brush the back, but it is very um, disruptive to, to actually do the spine. So that's something that you would want to avoid also. So there is emerging evidence of the effectiveness with regard to modulating cortisol levels, improving behavior, and increasing school and social participation. Due to the variability in individual responses, deep pressure should be tailored to the individual needs of the recipient. So everybody is going to fit everybody a little bit differently, and you want to make sure that the therapist is kind of changing up the course of treatment with that um, client. Deep pressure seems to have benefits in many areas for most people, but individual responses may be considered in the design of future research. Further research should be considered due to the paucity of studies and their low quality. The evidence for or against is limited. Most of the studies that I found were either single case studies um, or interviews that were done by parents. So a lot of the research is kind of just back and forth. And lastly, therapeutic listening. Therapeutic listening is a practice-based evidence approach intended to support individuals who experience challenges with sensory processing dysfunction, listening, attention, and communication. It's used on self-regulation and arousal for ADLs, social emotional skills, and sincere motor skills in children with sensory processing delays, disorders, and dysfunction. It's an intervention approach utilizing sound-based technology where the individual uses a CD and headphones to increase sensory integration through controlled sensory information. It's used as a component to sensory integration intervention in children with sensory processing disorder. Occupational therapists modify the music utilized during the intervention plan to synchronize the environment and surroundings with sounds that increase attention, body movements, and interactions based on the individual's needs and behaviors. Children with ASD show, express, and demonstrate specific behavioral patterns as well as having difficulty communicating, expressing, and socializing with others. Children living with ASD experience and undergo poor sensory processing, such as not attending to specific stimuli, as well as an over or underreacting. ASD in children impacts the way sound is processed. Parents report that therapeutic listening improves their child's behavior and notice a decrease in the amount of stress in their child's life. Exposure to therapeutic listening allows for neurological changes within the brain, which impacts behavior, attention, and self-regulation. Therapeutic listening, when combined with sensory integrative interventions, has shown to increase attention, organized behavior, self-regulation, postural control, coordination, fine motor control, motor planning, oral motor skills and articulation, social skills, communication, and visual skill development. In a study done by Wal Wahlberger and Frick 2017, a clinical setting under expert guidance, therapeutic listening interventions were used commonly as an assessment tool. A pre and post test design were implemented measuring the effects on self-regulation and arousal, ADL, social emotional skills, and sensory motor skills. The, the children were enrolled in the 2016-2017 school year and evaluated by occupational therapists with advanced clinical expertise. During the pretest level, the comps and the very VMI were administered by OTs, and parents completed the SPM and FLQ measurements. The intervention involved a 15 to 20 minute session of therapeutic listening quick shift twice daily for eight weeks total. 
The results of the study supported the use of therapeutic listening as a complementary approach to sensory integration intervention for improving self-regulation and arousal, ADLs, social emotional skills, and sensory motor skills in children with sensory processing disorders. And these are our references. 